Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone and welcome to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Let's get started. Welcome back to Raising Parents, the Parenting Signs Insights Podcast. If you're wondering why Dina sounds and looks different, it's because Dina isn't here today. Marie is. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm filling in for Dina while she's on a well-deserved break in the UK. Today, we're talking about homeschooling and what its pros and cons are for both children and parents, especially since the global COVID-19 pandemic. Homeschooling has been essential rather than a choice. But those who homeschool actually argue that it allows a focus on the student's needs rather than just grades. And to learn more about what homeschooling offers in contrast to traditional schooling, we are speaking to Dr. David Roy, lecturer and researcher in education and creative arts at the University of Newcastle. Hi, David. Lovely having you on the show. How are you going today? Great. Um, great to be here. Thanks for having me here. And I'm looking forward to this uh, lovely chat we're going to have about homeschooling. Amazing. I mean, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here. Um, this is a topic that I'm aware Dina was particularly excited for as she herself was homeschooled. But I mean, I wasn't homeschooled, but I've always wondered what homeschooling would be like, especially as um, a socially inept kid. Well, I mean, I I have both been part of the research developing homeschooling in New South Wales. I've actually homeschooled one of my kids, uh, not both of them. I have two children, and I've also I, I trained teachers to be teachers, and I've been a teacher in mainstream school. So I've kind of had a finger in every part of the education pie. Um, so I, I like to come from it with an open mind uh, to talk about both the, the strengths and some of the challenges that we might discover along the way in the next little bit of discussion on the podcast. Amazing. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this. But before we get started, we like to get to know you better. This is Have You Met Dr. David Roy? What is your favorite book? Whoa, favorite book. Um, Well, I'm an educator, so I love books. I have so many books, uh, probably told by my family that I should be putting more into boxes and and selling them. Um, I guess one of the first books I really remember when I was young uh, was uh, the book Tintin. Uh, I really liked Tintin books. Uh, I liked the comic drawings, the style of art, got me interested in in that area of creative arts. I liked the history that was based upon it. And also the adventure narrative. And I guess I still do like books like Tintin and Asterix, the kind of the European uh, comic book. If it was a serious book, it would probably be White Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys, uh, which is, uh, after reading it, I discovered it was a feminist book. Um, and if those who can't tell from my accent, I identify uh, more as, as he, him. Uh, and yet I embraced all the ideas and it's just, a lovely book. I could go on for hours. I could talk about books for hours um, and I would bore and take over the whole podcast. So we'll stop at that point. Yeah, well, like, you don't have to be a female to be a feminist or a group well, feminist idea. So that's great. I, I, I have problems with a male claiming to be a feminist because I think there's a lot of virtual signaling going on there. Um, so let, let's just leave it that I, I embrace old people and I just <laughs> think we should be nice to everyone. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you there. Um, Do you have a favourite film? Oh, again, movies, pop culture. If you haven't picked up already, I'm a a deeply sad nerd. Um, I kind of... My father was a scientist and he introduced me very on to science fiction. And there's a movie um, that many people haven't heard of called Capcom 1, uh, which is about a proposed um, mission to Mars from the 1970s, of course, 
the mission doesn't happen and the government fakes it because of funding reasons. So it deals with the science and it deals with thriller and conspiracy. Uh, and it's just a really great movie. So if you've got a streaming service or you've got someone who's got a really weird DVD collection, Capricorn One um, is a movie I can watch time and time again. Mm -hmm. I have heard of Mission to Mars. I just embarrassingly enough haven't actually watched it. So I might, I just might. Uh, during movie night um, at some point soon. <laughs> uh, do you have a favourite podcast and no obligation or pressure to say this one <laughs> at all? <laughs> I, I do have, um, so I, I do listen to the old podcasts. I, I like the podcasts often that are done uh, by people that I know. I had a friend who was a politician in Britain called Tom Harris who did do a podcast about his life as a politician. He, he's no longer that at all, a politician, but he stopped doing it. Um, one I, I quite like is um, it's kind of a podcast, more YouTube kind of clip thing called Cineblend, uh, which looks at kind of up and coming kind of uh, mainstream movies, uh, more like your kind of your Marvel, DC, Deanna Jones ones. And I find that quite interesting to listen to when I'm making one of my multiple coffees of the day mm -hmm. are they on youtube yeah it's called oh. cinema blend uh, on youtube so you do get um podcasts coming onto youtube as i think i actually found um when i've watched the the parenting podcast this one is on youtube as well it gets posted up there sometimes so um that's a good one and viewpoints is a australian one that i sometimes get asked to go on so mm -hmm. i will give that give them a shout out as well yeah, I was asking because I think I've actually heard Cineblend before, but I can't remember. I think it must have been while I was doom scrolling through YouTube at some point. So, <laughs> but yeah. That's real old dude. Yeah. Real old doom scroll. Uh, do you have a famous role model? Well, this might come to my little topic at the end. I mean, there have been people all the way through society who have done great things and they've also always been flawed human beings um, in, in all that they're good uh, and the bad that they did. So I'm going to choose um, a musical role model and that was a, a man called Chris Squire um, who was a bass player for a band in the 1970s and 80s called Yes. Um, so there's, there's lots of people, I don't know if I'd say role model who were famous, um, I, I prefer real people who I meet and have had influence on me in my life uh, because all the famous people seem to have real flaws as well at times. Yeah, and the best part about having a role model that you know personally is just like they touch you in ways that just a famous person can't because you don't know them personally and, you know, sometimes things come out about them and you're like, oh, no, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> You know, and then again, every all of us are imperfect people, yeah. so I can accept flaws in people, just some flaws are just a little bit too big to yeah. accept. <laughs> um, so that's sorry, I'm just gonna repeat that because I had a few things that I wanted to say, but then I realized it might not be appropriate to say on the podcast, so I won't go anywhere you want. I'm happy to go anywhere, <laughs> they can edit all there afterwards. I was going to list the things that just want acceptable in famous role models but i feel like maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so what's the last course you've completed oh well the last course i recently undertook a course uh, about disability awareness uh, which was a course part of my work um, which is quite ironic given that i've been working within a disability sector part like uh, supporting an education um so we're always being asked to do courses. The last, last major course I probably undertook was my PhD, um, which is why I have the not a real doctor title. Um, so yeah, that'll be the last one officially, but we're always doing training courses mm -hmm. to make sure that we're supporting students at university. Yeah, it's always good to learn on the go. Um, what's the biggest takeaway that you got from the disability awareness course? Um, I get two takeaways that I realize, oh, I actually know a lot more than I thought I did. And on any course I do, I always discover something that I should have known that and I didn't. So I can take on board. The best thing about any course is when you discover a new way to treat someone with more respect. Um, that's what I like 
I like to find out ways that I can improve as I get older and realize that life is moving forward and I need to find better ways to respect people. Because if you if you want to be respected and as in treated nicely, you treat people nicely back uh, and it makes a happier world. I love that. Uh, do you have an, like a specific example of that? Because I'm really genuinely interested. Um, a, a specific example. Um, we had a really good discussion about uh, when people have disabilities, about how to identify them. And some people were saying, um, you know, the people liked, so it's better to identify I, with the disability. I, I am a, I am a deaf person as opposed to a person who is deaf. Mm -hmm. And it was the whole idea of like, don't assume anything, just ask the person how they like to be identified. And it's about, again, that reaching out to people and saying, what do you want rather than society or the rest of us imposing something upon it? And again, that's a respectful thing, and not just within disability, but within anything, uh, as in um, oh, how you like to be, I like to be called David. I don't really enjoy the title that much unless I want to be horrible to someone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, treat people as, you use the term that the person feels comfy with. It yeah. doesn't require me to do so. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I've seen a lot of discourse on both sides about the person who is deaf versus deaf person thing. And yeah, I agree with you. The The solution here really is just to ask because yeah. different people have different preferences on how they'd like to be addressed. So yeah. it, that's, it's, the same, yeah. it's the same with pronouns. People get all head up about, did you use the right pronoun? Ask the person what pronouns they want. Go for it. Why does it impact on my life any other way apart from me being a plight up person? So, <laughs> yeah, amazing. Uh, now we'll move on to the interview section of the show. We're getting down into the main purpose for us having this recording. Um, first question is, what do you think parenting is? What is your definition of parenting? Parenting. It's the person or people who look after a child full time, as in through, you know, through the evening in the morning, not like the seven hours that they, they head off to an establishment, as can often be the case, but it's the person who cares for the child. Um, a parent isn't necessarily someone who gave birth or adopted a child. For some people, it is the foster, it becomes the parent, uh, or it is uh, the social worker, who is the person who's in charge, because we've got to remember our kids have multiple backgrounds. Sometimes it can be an old sibling who becomes the parent uh, or an uncle or an aunt. So it's the person who cares for that child and looks after that child's interests for the for the majority of time. Yeah, I like the way you put it because some people, like as an older sibling myself, I do have an ex like an experience with taking over the parenting when my parents aren't home uh, or my parents are away or doing other things. So yeah. Uh, what do you think expectant parents need to be aware of in transitioning to parenthood? <laughs> uh, the fact that you are not, never going to be prepared. I speak from experience as a parent myself and watching many people. Listen, it is the most frustrating and yet joyous time. Uh, it can be you will think you're doing the right thing and you will make mistakes and you're not to beat yourself up about that. Find your way of decompressing. Some, type, some people it can be a glass of wine. Some glasses are bottle shaped. <laughs> For some people it can be a walk on the beach or uh, it can be multitude of things. And just be aware it is a journey and it is a bit like a boat journey where you go through peaks and troughs of the waves and it is all part and parcel of the learning process. But it can be one of the best growing experiences of your life as well as hopefully the the person that you're given responsibility for it sounds so tumultuous yet you know I mean? exciting and freeing but also not in every single possible way uh, yeah that's all i can i have no experience being a parent at all <laughs> I'm... Well, I'd, I'd, I'd be wary of anyone who says they have the answers we all have bits of answer but no one has all the answers. The person who has all the answers is probably bringing up a child that will go on to be a mass psycho murderer. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on this cast, but that's my humor. Um, no one has all the answers. 
I like your humor, David. <laughs> um, what are your definitions of homeschooling and traditional schooling? What are the primary distinctions between the two? Well, I, actually, I think there's there's three things going on, not just two. So I'm going to move away from the binary. I think we have homeschooling. I think we have remote learning, and we have traditional schooling. And part of the, the I guess the description at the beginning reminded me more of remote learning because when COVID happened, we all went online. Uh, and it was amazing how school systems said, oh, we can't do online. And yet when they had to, they suddenly could. And there's a whole different issue there. And that was remote learning where you are on the computer, but you're learning from a teacher who's in a mainstream school. And so you've got all the kind of the structures of a mainstream school and a qualified teacher who's got multiple children in front of them. Homeschooling is when the child or the children of that household are taught by a parent who the parent takes on the role of the teacher. And it's one of the sacrifices that homeschoolers make is the fact that in our many modern societies, if there are two adults in the household, both of them work. In a homeschooling situation, one of them is not working. One of them is the teacher, uh, whether they're qualified or not. And they are creating the curriculum. They are doing all the teaching. They're just trying to make sure it matches with the rules society has. So when those kids hit 18, they're actually able to engage in the wider society. But basically all the teaching and learning happens in the house. Or the garden. <laughs> the household. Right. So... How does homeschooling impact a child's ability to socialize compared to traditional schooling if they are spending most of their time at home? Well, this is one of the arguments that many individuals who are against homeschooling uh, would state. And I'd like to say I'm not biased towards one or the other. I'm pro people having the choice if they can carry it off either way. Because I think sometimes homeschooling works, sometimes it feels... Sometimes mainstream traditional education works, sometimes it fails. So the socialization has always been an argument to put up. I have met lots of kids who homeschool and they socialize with lots of kids. Isn't it amazing how kids are able to socialize after three in the afternoon when they're not in a school because there's a thing called the street and the village or the town or the city and there are clubs to go to. And if you're homeschooling, then, well, maybe there's other homeschoolers and they can connect as well. In fact, quite often there are homeschooling communities who organize these events. And so there has never been an issue for socialization for some kids. There are some kids who don't want to socialize as much. And for them, homeschooling means they can have that choice. They don't get that choice in the mainstream. So there's a, a pro and balance. So basically, if you want your kid to socialize, you will find ways and they will find ways to socialize. So it's a kind of a furphy. That's a word I used to meet as it's not really a good argument with people you don't socialize because you do. Right. That's a good point. I never thought that that be like a homeschooling community yeah. um, at all. I, I guess it's because like I was never in the homeschooling community. So that yeah, so that just never was in my realm of reality at all. But it makes sense now, like if, because every child, well, not every child, but most children would go for extra classes or recreational activities and they make friends there. Really? Um, so in that sense, would like with, with, I'm, I, I'm aware I'm stuttering here, so I'm just going to... <laughs> You're a human. It's a yeah. wonderful thing. Be yourself, because this is what we like on the... I like on podcasts is when it becomes real. This is not rehearsed. It's not formalized. Go for it. I'm, I'm all for Thank it. Thank you. I just have many thoughts right now, Tell and me. I'm relating it back to my high school experience of, like, uh, being bullied and um, just you know, general social awkwardness and just wanting to get out of there because I didn't relate to anyone in my high school or most people in my high school. And it was just, it was just like a living hell, basically. So from what I'm gathering, that kind of takes out that whole pressure of having to be in a school 
swarming with kids that you don't actually enjoy the company of. Yep. Uh, and it, it's interesting. We've got research data from the remote learning, different to homeschooling that happened during COVID. And they all said, oh, this is terrible for kids. They're not thriving. There was a whole group of kids who loved it because of exactly the reasons you said. They no longer needed to deal with the school politics of the bullies and the, you know, the jocks and the, 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 the whatever the other grouping is, the goths or whatever grouping you had in your school and the, <laughs> the cops, the cliques. Um, that they could be themselves remotely. And for some of them, they have transitioned into full homeschooling. In fact, what we found is that homeschooling, which was already on the increase before COVID, has gone through the roof. Um, to, to give you a little bit of boring data to, I suppose I should do Please, that as a researcher. I love boring data. <laughs> most school enrollments, because of population increase in both public and independent private schools, go up about 2 to 3% per year. For the past little while, before COVID, homeschooling was going up about 10 to 12 percent a year. Now, that's a significantly larger amount. It's increasing. Still, small numbers of people doing it. In the last year, in Australia, in the state of New South Wales, where I am, the number of people who applied to become official homeschool households went up by nearly 40 percent. Enrollments in public schools, 2%. Homeschooling, 40%. There are people who have realized that through the remote learning experience of COVID, that homeschooling is what works for their kids. And, and that's great, so long as they're willing to make the sacrifice that it takes to do it. Because it, it, there are disadvantages as well as advantages to homeschool. Yeah, that's amazing that you point that out and now i'm just wondering how much of a toll does it take on the parents the person who does the homeschooling for the kids like how much sacrifice is that what does the sacrifice look like it must take a lot of time and effort and also where do they start i have so many questions <laughs> <laughs> well listen there's lots of lots of ways to go first like the online community of homeschoolers is really supportive. In fact, when COVID happened, a lot of teachers from mainstream and homeschooling communities connected to each other because the homeschoolers wanted to help the teachers because they didn't know how to do remote learning homeschool. That said, um, basically, there's got to be a curriculum. So you've got to start finding the documents that are online from governments to say, this is what your seven-year-old kid is meant to do in literacy, in numeracy, in science, in history, in geography, in the creative arts, in physical education. And you'd have to download the whole curriculum and look at it and then find a way of delivering that. And the beautiful thing about curriculum is they want you to have skills and knowledges, but how you teach those skills and knowledges is up to you. And actually, parents are really good teachers because for the first four or five years of a child's life, they tend to have been teaching them basic things, you know, how not to set fire to yourself in the household, how not to drown in the bathtub, all those lovely little things, as well as your basic alphabet. And in the primary years, many homeschooling families do find it, yeah, we can run with this. It's when we get to secondary that many homeschooling families will start to go, now it becomes complex. Because I, I don't know about anyone at home, but I've looked at my kids' secondary mathematics and gone, Okay, we're now getting to the stage where as the family, as, as the father, I cannot help any longer. This is beyond my scope because it's been too many decades since I last did this. Um, that, that can be the disadvantage. It can start to be a struggle. The other disadvantage is, of course, the parent is at home all the time. It can be lovely with the kids, but then you've got to find the time to say, when am I the teacher and when am I just the parent? When am I just, they're, they're just my kids as opposed to my students. Um, and that that means you have to set boundaries and times and maybe structure it. There is a thing called unschooling where the kids are in charge and they decide what they learn and when they learn it. And for some families that works. For other families, that doesn't work. And it's again about the individual. Um, there's a financial hit. Schools, I, the, I'm going to use the Australian context. Most kids, uh, the government spends about $13,000 per kid, per year, on their education, if you average it all out. If you homeschool, the government spends 
zero on you. There is no funding. Uh, so you have to fund it yourself. And that includes resources, signing up to online things, um, getting textbooks, paper pegs, all of those materials that often governments will supply if you're public schooling. Uh, you have to provide yourself. And remember that parent who's homeschooling? And it might be shared between two parents, but there's basically a full-time parent who's not working, which is great if you can afford that. So you also do tend to find that people who homeschool can afford to do it. Um, and that means it's, it can be more challenging for those who are struggling more financially. can be done, and I've seen amazing homeschooling things happen with those families. Um, but those are some of the disadvantages. The advantage is you get to control the curriculum. Your kid gets to learn in ways that really engage them. Uh, for your listeners at home, just to make the point, there's no such thing as learning style, okay? That's a, that's a falsehood. You don't have a learning style. You can't say, I'm a visual learner. Because if you're a visual learner, uh, unless you are completely deaf, you're also an oral learner because you hear noises and you learn from them. You're also a literacy learner because you're probably going to read things visually. You probably touch things. So you're a tactile learner as well. And you might use them. So we, we learn all in multiple ways. There are ways that we feel comfortable in, but we actually use multiple forms of learning. And the great thing about homeschooling is you can use everything around you. You could uh, do maths or cooking dinner or take the kids out to the supermarket with you to buy your shopping. And we're doing mathematics, but we're also maybe talking about the origins of the food sources. So we're maybe doing a little bit of history and geography, or maybe we're actually doing some PE. So the advantage is every experience in the household becomes a learning experience and you can make kids do household chores as part of their learning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it, 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 it's, it's great. And rather than being the kid that's switched off in school because they're forced to do things that they're just disengaged to, you can find topics that will engage them. Your kid loves soccer, football. You can teach through soccer and football by both with reading and with activities. If your kid loves painting butterflies, then that can become the starting point for your science, for your math, for your numeracy, for everything. So in some ways, it's incredibly freeing because you're not restricted to what 30 other kids around you have to do. But at the same time, it means that you're always on the go and active, which is both beautiful and exhausting. And that I'm speaking from personal experience. You are really selling yeah. it to me, though. I mean, not at, like not from a parent's perspective. Like that's definitely something that I would consider for my child. It's just from like a child's perspective that I I reckon that kind of curriculum would have helped me a lot because I tend to learn better through personal experience. So for example, learning math through going to the grocery store or learning history by pointing out like, or the history behind this apple or like this packaging and things like that, that would have helped me retain information so much better than just like reading off a textbook, which I fell asleep through a lot of the time. <laughs> but for some kids, they hate that. They want to be in school because when they are at home, they just want to be with family and they want to switch off from learning, uh, even though learning is happening all the time. So um, yeah, it, look, it works for some, it doesn't work for others. And it can be quite tiring because sometimes the kids then start to see everything as a learning experience. And you as the parent kind of go, I just want to stop. <laughs> like, just... <laughs> Stop, stop talking. Just, and, and that's when the bad use of the iPad comes into play. When it's, here's a Minecraft game, go away for two hours. <laughs> or let's play hide and seek. Okay, you hide, I will seek. And you walk out and leave the kid alone. Um, so, yeah, it, it, again, it's down to the individual. The one thing I dislike is when it's imposed, either that you can't or you, you must. Uh, and we, we find, I guess you would call them the evangelists of either, either camp, Will sometimes try to force it in. The one thing that always made me more interested in homeschooling was when I discovered that Hitler banned it. And actually, it's still really, it's not banned, but it's actively discouraged in Germany. And the fact that Hitler didn't like it made me want to like it a bit more. <laughs> um, because 
there is an element of school trying to control in society. And that's one of the motivations for people undertaking homeschooling. Um, the, the one that people seem to think that people homeschool for is for religious reasons. And that's one of the smallest percentages of, of justifications for it, because most schools are accommodating for most religions. But the biggest grouping, actually, is because either they don't believe in control and authority in society. The other one, and one of the reasons I'm involved in that disability and inclusion aspect I was talking before, is because children with disabilities are not getting their needs met within schools. Some could argue that the schools actively encourage them to select homeschooling so the schools in the mainstream don't have to deal with it. And that's coming back to that whole issue of why we have mainstream schools and is it actually for everybody and do they, are they actually truly inclusive? Uh, and that's a whole different podcast to deal with for the parents about what do you do when school goes wrong? Uh, answers on a postcard to David Roy at the University of Newcastle. But for people with a disability, some of them, they find that they will actually get a better learning experience. I, I like a mix, maybe a little bit of homeschooling, a little bit of distance education. I think the socialization is not only important for the child with a disability, I think it's for important for the children without a disability to socialize with people with disabilities because then they become accepted members of the community. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's, I, that's, that's, yeah. That's, off, that's off topic slightly. No, not, not at all. I, I see both sides of it completely. Um, as someone who has a learning disability, high school was so difficult for me because the teachers weren't really aware of what this disability was or like what it entailed and what extra attention I'd need. Or they also wouldn't have the time to spare to give me the extra attention that I needed. So in that sense, homeschooling would have been better for me. But at the same time, my my, my parents would have been would have needed to be aware of what my needs were and um and deliver that as well. Um, so I can definitely see two sides to it. Um, like the ones that you're presenting right now. Um, so I, can I can I pick up on that? Yeah. that? That's why the homeschooling communities are so important. Mm -hmm. Some of them are great. Find the right one that fits with you because we're not imperfect. As parents, when we're homeschooling, and I have I've spent time doing that, um, we need support as well. And you got to remember, I was a qualified teacher, and I found aspects of homeschooling, and my wife found aspects of it really challenging. Um, as for us, and, and if we're finding it challenging. And, you do find a lot of homeschooling parents. There's someone who is a qualified educator within in the family somewhere. So that's why having a supportive community is important. Uh, just even if you're not that involved on the fringes, people you can reach out to on a Facebook group or in in face-to-face, you got to remember one of the reasons that schools mainstream work is teachers can support each other within the school. If, it's a, if, it's a, if a school works well, they've got teachers supporting each other. The really bad schools are the ones where teachers don't like each other. So having that as a homeschooler in that community can be a real benefit. So what are some of the biggest challenges you went through as a parent who was homeschooling your kids? <laughs> I was a bit like the plumber with the leaky tap because I'm dealing <laughs> with education all the time and I'm at work. We made the choice. I, I had the better income, so my wife was doing more of the homeschooling work. Um, I, and both our kids have at times been homeschooled. One of them did it for about three months and said, I prefer mainstream, let me go back. We went, cool, off you go. The other one really thrived within the homeschooling experience. I guess the challenges for us was finding enough things to keep our kids engaged and sometimes pushing through on the quite tedious rot material that they needed to do. Um, what was beneficial is my, my partner is, is quite good with numeracy, comes from an accounting background. I'm quite good with literacy. So those two main areas we kind of covered. We're both good at creative arts things. I'm probably a little bit better with science. Uh, she, she's probably a little bit better with doing hands-on. So I, I would enjoy teaching the theory and she would enjoy doing the practical activity we do. Um, it would just, it would take up so much of our time. We'd be exhausted. <laughs> I'd be coming, I would do shift work. I'd come back in from work and take on some of that and, and sometimes our, our, our son in particular, who was doing it for longer, you know, he'd get up on a Saturday morning and want to do some homeschooling. 
What? Well, yeah, well, that's the thing. The hours are <laughs> flexible. So maybe on a Wednesday, you might be doing a bit from 9 o'clock through to 11 o'clock. And that's, you know, that's it. We've got cognitive overload. We're, we're not going to do uh, any more. But then you're doing a bit, you're doing some on Thursday, Friday. You feel, oh, you've done a lot. But some activity really engaged. And he wants to do more of that on the Saturday. And you're kind of going, it's the weekend. <laughs> I okay, why not? And so it becomes more of a fun activity because you can't, if you're wanting to homeschool, when the educational moment arises, you have to grasp it. Otherwise, you're creating a school homeschool with regulated hours. And if you're just going to do nine through to three o'clock standard, I kind of go just send them to school because they've got more resources um, and it allows you to have more coffee. So at times it was the most invigorating experience and sometimes it was really tiring and frustrating when when the learning was hard. It became hard when you're a parent and you see your kids struggle and you want to be the one who go, yeah, you can run to me to comfort, but no, you're the teacher, so you've got to push them. So at times we had to debate in the household who, if you were teaching the knowledge, the other one would become the parent to be the comfort because you can't quite be the parent as the homeschooler teacher. So th that that's a hard rule to do. Yeah, as well. that sounds like a very difficult rule to enforce. Um, Life yeah. is a challenge. <laughs> so, are there any specific academic advantages or disadvantages to homeschooling? Yep. Are there any statistics that you have? More yeah. boring data uh, there because is, there's, there's we love lots boring, of boring data. data. Yeah, and the boring data tells us. There is no significant difference between the outcomes of children at home schools and children who are not homeschooled. There is some anecdotal data that some children who are homeschooled are more confident, but then there's some anecdotal data that they're less confident. Some of them are more sociable, some are less. It's the same as any school. So there, all the data came through. You know what? We have doctors who and lawyers who were homeschooled. We have unemployed people who were homeschooled. We have got happy people who were homeschooled and we've got people with mental health issues who were homeschooled. It is no different to the mainstream school. Um, it's all down to the family and the individual and the parents. And it is a choice to make. Anything you do will be a sacrifice. Uh, if you homeschool, you will spend more quality time with your children, but you will also have other disadvantages as we've been talking about financially. Sometimes the roles get confusing of what you're doing. Sometimes, I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but any parent who is a, a genuine parent will understand this one. Sometimes you have too much time with your children. So it's a swings and roundabouts. Oh, totally. But, I, well, can I make one fundamental principle? Yes, though, that please, go one, ahead. What, I was a real, real question in our house as we were discussing it. And then I looked at, because I read books, I looked at some stuff about First Nation peoples around the world. And there's a commentary that comes through from all of them, whether it be in the Americas or in Australia or in other nations. Why do you raise a child for five years and then give them to a complete stranger to bring up when you want to be instilling your values into them? And that's First Nation groupings talking about mainstream schools. And that to me went, along with Hitler, kind of made me go, we could do this. And it worked. We discovered at pri after primary that our son who was being homeschooled, he started to want to also go to a mainstream school. And so that's what's happened. So we, it was his decision not to be uh, homeschooled in secondary, which is ironic because of one of our, our other kids for a, a, pile, a, a while in his secondary school he wanted to experience homeschooling because he was jealous of his little brother in the pro doing the primary stuff. Um, and, and he enjoyed it. He said, I want to go back to the main street. That's their call. So uh, it will always be the children's, I think as a parent, give your children a voice. Yeah. And how convoluted is this like going from homeschooling to mainstream schooling and then back if let's say the child decides that it's not working for them or the parent decides that it's not working for them? Like I just imagine it's because the, there's the, there must be some paper, no, like a yeah. bunch of paperwork to do 
um how annoying is it or how easy is it uh, we we didn't find that a challenge because coming from an education background we're used to paperwork um <laughs> it's actually harder enrolling them in the mainstream than it is in the homeschooling we found uh we, I would always recommend that you do it officially. There are a lot of people who just homeschool unofficially. Clearly, that's breaking the law in every country. Um, you will also find that some schools and systems, and Germany plays with this one sometimes. I've seen it happen in the UK as well. They go, you're not allowed to homeschool. Well, actually, yes, you are. There are very few countries where it's illegal. You just go through the paperwork. If you make sure that you're actually teaching your kid and they come to visit to check, because they have to check for safety for children. There's a whole child protection duty of care that governments have. Um, you can do what you want, and you just get that renewed every six months initially, and then it's a year, and then a two-year rolling. You choose you want to go back. You say, I want to enroll in my, main, my local mainstream, and they have a duty of care to do that. So you just go through the system like you would joining a football club or joining anything else you just fill in the form send them off and until the changeover happens do what you're doing cool so, that sounds relatively yeah. like that sounds relatively durable it does i mean you do know that as soon as you start to do it, you're going to hit a barrier because it's always individual some people are highly organized it goes by sometimes people just hit a wall and it becomes more convoluted life throws lemons at you my argument is make lemonade um <laughs> but there'll always be a way to do what you want to do for your kid because when it comes down to what you what your kid wants i will always make that as a priority that's such a good yeah, quote yeah. always make it a priority by dr david roy 2023 um so are you aware of any emotional and psychological aspects to I, homeschooling and I mean, how does it differ I, from traditional schooling in terms of a child's mental well-being and self-esteem are there any differences there no it's, it's what i've said and i guess we've said this before there is no statistical difference in outcomes academically socially emotionally for kids with homeschooling it's again down to what we do as parents how we engage with our kids kids get damaged at school kids get damaged by parents kids thrive in school and kids thrive with parents um, it's all to do with, and I, I, I'm actually going to use a serious word here that is often misused, is to do with love. If we treat kids with love in everything we do, whether you're a teacher or a parent or a homeschool teacher or a mainstream teacher or an uncle or an aunt, if you treat them with love and your actions are based on love, then you're probably going to get some quite healthy kids coming out of it so long as you get the opportunity to let them do things. And even... When we're in disadvantage, there's still with that aspect of care and love, the most disadvantaged people could be some of them the most healthy mentally, socially, or academically. Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry about this. We will create the barriers if, that will damage our kids if we're not careful. So just be looking for those aspects of love. That's so true. I mean, like I was traditionally schooled, but I reckon I got just as much trauma from traditional schooling as I did at home. <laughs> so, and it's also like kind of up to the kid, right? To like how they receive it and how their mind takes it because every kid's going to treat experiences a bit differently what might affect one kid negatively might not affect the other yeah so yeah so it's kind of just up to that how can parents ensure that their homeschool <laughs> children receive a well-rounded education that covers all the necessary subjects and skills well the big thing is is i'll come back to this is register your kid for homeschooling be accredited because actually one of the purposes of accreditation is to make sure that you're covering all the main bases that kids need to learn. They're actually wanting to make sure kids are developing. And I found it a really reassuring thing that when they'd come for their yearly visit and they'd actually check and I'd be able to go, we've done the right things. I know I'm an educator, but have I actually done the right things or have my own biases and influences come into play here in a way that they shouldn't have? So that's the way that you know also if you've got happy kids if your kids seem to be happy and hitting their age appropriate milestones 
and interests in whatever it is in reading or in music or in science, and they can grasp and grow concepts. And you are learning things, you're probably doing the right way. The other aspect is I actually kept a checklist because I'm really sad and I'm quite scatty minded. And I need to have a list to keep me on track because for those listening at home, if you haven't worked it out, I'm quite happy to go off on a slight tangent. Uh, I'd, I'd be slightly... Uh, side sorry. questing. Yes, that's side questing. I, I like that word. Good word. <laughs> uh, side questing from Marie in 2023. <laughs> um, that could be a whole new podcast you could set up. The side questing podcast. Totally. We, it's actually my entire personality. Where we go off on a, <laughs> on a weird journey and no one knows yeah. where the podcast will go. As Maybe well, we can start the podcast. It will be side questing <laughs> with Marie and David. <laughs> I could call that. <laughs> uh, so just have a checklist make sure it's all working mm-hmm. to plan it's all good yeah we love checklists to keep our mind on yeah. the right track um so looking to the future do you think homeschooling might become more popular compared to traditional schooling it's i have the data it is um <laughs> re- remote learning has showed us it had a it had positive effects for some people in the community not all the doom and gloom that some of the newspapers wanted to put out. Oh, our kids are not being educated. Our kids were educated in remote learning. It's increasing by up to nearly 40%. And that's just in the state of New South Wales. We know in other states in Australia it's going bigger. We know it's happening bigger in the UK and in America. America's going, they're going gangbusters with it. Um, so yes, it is increasing. And as it's increasing, authorities are starting to clock and go, Maybe we should be actually taking a note of this data more in our overall national education statistics because homeschooling's kind of gone under the radar. Um, and I, I think all power to it. Uh, for those people who think they can do it, I, I will always argue the best person to know your kids should be the parent. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't have traditional schooling, but I think it should make traditional schooling look at itself in the 21st century and think about what is the best way we can do this because I don't think it has been. I think we've been doing a very similar form of education system for the past 100 to 150 years. And I know we've added in computers, but we kind of use them as if they're chalkboards. Uh, I know we've added in desks that are sitting around. We still kind of have the teacher at the front being the authoritarian hierarchical figure. I think there's new ways of learning and I think there's new ways of doing it and where the kids have a say in their learning, where the kids choose the topics. We can still teach the same knowledge and skills. We must teach knowledge, we must teach basic skills. But the context of it, I think we can learn from homeschooling in that way. So I'd love to see the, the, it not be a, an either or. I'd love to see a uniting of the different systems of schoolings to get the best for all and the best outcome for each individual kid. I love that sentiment so much. Um, but for parents who may not have a teaching background, apart from homeschooling communities, what other resources or supports are available to help them navigate through these? If you have a computer and you have the inter- internet, that World Wide Web, every teaching resource you can use is there. In fact, I'm going to now give you a little kind of a um, dark secret the, the teaching, the schooling teaching arts, a number of educators, myself included, often go online to find inspiration of ways to teach, to keep it fresh. Teachers put up the resources, they share them because teachers are nice people. Use their resources, they've done it already. Use that. You want to find a, a, a lesson of teaching science at age appropriate for someone who's 15 years old, there will be a lesson online is free up there in the internet or on Facebook, or there will be a book because you know what? Publishers pu- publish books on how to teach. So if you want to learn how to say, teach the arts in primary and early childhood, I cannot but recommend the textbook, Teaching the Arts, Primary Education and Early Childhood. <laughs> it's published by Cambridge University Press. And I'm getting a laugh from Marie because one of the authors is called Dr. David Roy. So there's books out there you can get that are literally, here's how you teach it. So there's tons of stuff out there. And and speak to people. Just speak to people. 
Let's I get. love that. Yeah. Thank you so much for your suggestions and your advice. That was so helpful. Before we wrap this podcast episode up, we have one last question. What advice would you give to the parents who are so bravely considering homeschooling over traditional schooling? Start it unofficially. And that means your kid goes to mainstream school, but at the weekends, try doing it yourself. Dip your toe in it. Why not? Or maybe in the school holidays, go, you know what? We've got a summer holiday coming up. Let's spend a week seeing how we would teach next year's curriculum. The kid will go, oh, that'll be a nightmare. So choose something fun. Do it maybe while you're out caravanning or holidaying in, in, on, on a Bali beach. And use the beach as your learning room. Try it. Or just look at the documents. Do you know what? It, anything new is always scary. But if you're actually thinking about it, it suggests to me there's something not happening for the mainstream that's working with your kid. What's best for your kid? Remember that little thing we talked about? Love. And what's best for your kid? We'll do the two things. If your love, your heart, is saying this is the best thing to do, part of me would say, take a gamble. Remember, mainstream will always be there. Okay. Thanks. That is such great advice. Thank you so much, David. Um, before we wrap this up, we will move on to the open mic section where you have the chance to take the floor and talk about anything that you're passionate about. Uh, anything at all. It can be coffee. It can be boring data. It can be your book. It doesn't have to be related to homeschooling. The floor is yours. I, I guess so. Um... I, I was thinking about this because we just before the podcast started, it was suggested to me about this. And then I started talking in my favorite book. I kind of went off on one about Bondazini and Tintin. But actually what I want to talk about is music. Um, I love music. Uh, my main teacher training area was actually in drama and English and religion, uh, interestingly enough. But I've also, I've also taught music because I in, was introduced at an early age, not just listening to it, but also playing it. And one of the interesting learning experiences was I found, it took a while to find my instrument. Um, I, I was had access to the piano and guitars, but it was the bass guitar that really connected with me. And the, the reason it did was whenever I listened to music, I would always be focusing on the low frequencies. And I loved the rhythm, but I didn't really have the coordination to be a drummer. But I also loved the basic structure of the music and that's what the bass does it links the rhythm to the music and i adore the bass guitar and i'm really boring as i will hear music and sometimes i'll just love a song i'll love a band uh, or a singer but if i don't i tend to then start to analyze the music and i'm listening to well what is the bass doing here how is it interacting with other instruments which is maybe showing the geek in me that i deconstruct everything um, but I love the fact that the bass stays in the background and it isn't the showy instrument. In fact, if you notice the bass, sometimes it's doing the wrong thing. So it's not like the lead guitarist who's also obviously got, she or he has got some inadequacies in their life. Or we have the lead <laughs> singer who's obviously got some kind of psychological narcissistic problems. The bass player is the musician who likes to the drummer uh, who's just the violent member getting out the energies in the band. And these are all the jokes that we see about music. Um, so I, I love it as an instrument. And I actually, I'm very aware when I've not picked up an instrument to play. I, I listen to music all the time. But if I've not picked up uh, an instrument I, or put, played against an instrument, because I, I, I now play multiple little instruments, um, if I haven't played somehow in a day, I'm very aware of it because it's the connection of my body just doing an activity, but also my mind being creative and also um, my mind thinking about structure. So it's using all the parts of my brain. And when you stick electrodes on top of people's heads and look at their brains, not in their heads, just on top, um, and they look at the, the currents that are going on, when music is being played by someone, there's something different going on in the brain where there's more electrical current flying across all the different parts of the brain than in most other activities. So I think it's something that will hopefully keep dementia at bay and it's just something that's fun. 
So find that fun passion because with all the other stuff that goes around in the world, whether it's COVID or uh, the banks uh, putting up the interest rates and making us all poor or idiot politicians, find something that gives you that piece of joy, um, whether it's personal or sharing with others. Uh, and, and music's that thing for me. I love that so much and I relate to that a lot as someone who plays the guitar. Um, I do really love listening to songs with heavy emphasis on the bass. It just, it's so simple, yet it gives the song so much body and it's not too complicated as well. So that's always really nice. Thank you yep. so much, David. Yep. Look, there's, a, there's a joke that um, the, the book that teaches you how to play the bass is one page long. The book that teaches you how to play the bass as an expert is 15,000 pages long. So it's like, it's one of those things, anyone can start with the bass and that's the gift of it. You know, you're literally hitting one string with being a bass player. But to really get complex on it can take more practice with it. Guitar is harder to start and then it's easier to develop. So it's, um, and I'm not actually diminishing guitarists because I, I, I do play guitar and I, I I'm yet to find a type of musical instrument that I dislike. No, I uh, mean, like, I like I do play the guitar and I can play the bass as well. It's just that I feel like I don't have as good a grasp on the bass as I do the guitar. It's still different, you know. It's, it's where your heart and your yeah. ears are. Yeah, like, I, I couldn't take over a bassist's role, I feel like. I just wouldn't be playing the same. They just, yeah, it's just not, yeah, it's just not the same. Like, I don't know how else to put it, you know. Yeah. Like you can do both. Like if you play the guitar, you can play the bass, but it's just not going to be the same. It's yeah. not. And and knowing other people's instruments makes you a better player of your own instrument. So yeah. I, I taught myself piano because I wanted to work better with a pianist. I, I, I picked up different string instruments because I wanted to work with them as well, like violin and, and the cello, et cetera. So yeah, it makes you better at the your one instrument by being able to play multiple and being able it's like what we talk about. It's about understanding other people's perspectives. It's, it's about the empathy again, isn't it? It's why, what's the need of your child in homeschooling? See, I am a teacher. I brought it back to topic. It's about <laughs> looking at the other perspective, not just your own. Yeah. Um, learning an appreciation for someone else through shared experiences yeah. is really important. Beautiful. Thank you so much, David, for joining us today. If our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? Uh, I live on Twitter. So, at, <laughs> or is it X? I think it's called X now. At it's called D X now. That's but... DNS Roy. But if you just Google David Roy Education, you'll, you'll come across the, my university page, probably some weird articles, maybe some Twitter posts, maybe someone seeing how much they dislike me, all these kind of things. Um, feel happy to do that. Um, yeah. I, if you follow me, if if I see that I'm interested in your kind of area, I might follow back. But um, if you're just a random, I, I might not because otherwise I might be a bit creepy. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think Twitter is where you can get me or online, uh, just Google. Amazing. I might have to give you a follow myself after this. <laughs> yes, lots. Please do. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to Raising Parents, the Parenting Science Insights podcast, produced by the Parenting Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel, as it helps other people find it so that we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pa.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent. Thanks for tuning in.